your favorite ski resort is probably on public land. Of the 10 most popular ski resorts in the United States, nine of them are located on public land, mostly national forests. The White River National Forest in Colorado has 11 ski resorts by itself, including Vail, Aspen, Breckenridge, and Keystone. In fact, across the national forest system, there are 122 ski areas. And despite hosting only one quarter of all the ski areas in the United States, national forests account for half of all skier visits nationwide. Those visits also make skiing the second most popular recreational activity on national forests, behind only hiking, 16% of their entire visitation. And this is for a sport that can only happen a few months out of the year. And, and, this all happens on 0.1% of our national forest land. Yep, out of the roughly 188 million acres of national forests in the United States, only 188,000 are used for ski resorts. Which, when I learned all this, the question I had was, how? To reiterate, 16% of the entire visitation to our national forest takes place on just 0.1% of their land. That is a heavy concentration of users. I mean, what kind of impacts is this having on the forests? Also, how do these resorts operate on public land? What sorts of rules and regulations are there? What is the permit process? Like, is there even a permit process? There is. What about access? This is public land, so can they charge you to use the slopes? Ski resorts aren't an intuitive use of public land. I mean, how many of you knew that these big ski resorts were even located on national forests? But I'm going to answer all of those questions for you because that's kind of what I do here. My name is Cameron, this is National Park Diaries, and I make videos about parks and protected areas and public lands, and instead of giving you a list or a hiking guide, I just yell at you about why these places are so cool, but actually these videos are designed to be educational and engaging, and I would very much appreciate it if you gave the video a like and subscribe to the channel for more park stories. I also have a Patreon if you would like to support what I'm doing more directly, link in the description. All right, let's get into it. Oh, also when I say skiing in this video, I'm referring to skiing and snowboarding at like resorts. You, you know what I'm talking about. So I've thrown some numbers at you. We know skiing is a very popular winter recreational activity, and we know public lands are disproportionately represented when it comes to where people are going to ski. What I didn't know though is that skiing is like super old. There's evidence of skiing going back more than 4,000 years. And the first written accounts of skiing date back to the Vikings around 1000 AD. Here in North America, skiing wasn't introduced until the mid 19th century when some Scandinavian immigrants introduced it to the Midwest. It later became prominent among miners during the California Gold Rush. They actually had these super secret recipes for ski wax and they would compete against each other in downhill races, getting up to 85 miles per hour. Now, when you think of places that are good for skiing, what do you think of? Two hours later. Mountains, yeah, mountains. If you wanna go really fast down a hill on a couple of pieces of wood, you gotta have a mountain. And it just so happens that a lot of our national forest lands are in the mountains. Mountains are not very good places to build homes and cities and towns. So throughout American history, private ownership mostly developed in the lowlands while mountainous areas remained in the public domain. They eventually became national forests. But by the time skiing became popular and resorts started being built, this mainly started in like the 30s, you couldn't just go chopping down a national forest. You need permission for that sort of thing. You, you need a permit. Except the Forest Service didn't really have a special permit for ski areas. They really only had a specific permit system for logging and grazing. Everything else they just considered a special use. So ski resorts ended up falling into this like kind of clunky permit system called the dual permit system. Essentially resorts would need two permits, one for infrastructure, things like lifts and resorts. They granted these on a 30 year basis. The other permit was for ski trails and land uses. Essentially the land on which people would go and do 
the skiing. In exchange for these permits, ski resorts would pay a fee to the federal government for use of the land. You can think of it a little bit like rent. To give you an idea of how much we're talking about, Vail Resorts paid more than $6 million in the 2015-16 season for their use of the White River National Forest. But this permit, the land use one, had to be renewed annually. Ski resorts didn't really like this arrangement because it made financing more difficult. Finance people like long-term arrangements for big capital investments like that, and ski resorts are expensive, so having to renew a permit annually wasn't exactly ideal. So in 1986, Congress passes this law called the National Forest Ski Area Permit Act, the NFSAPA. This law is only like two pages long, I linked it in the description if you want to go read it, but the basic gist here was to implement an actual separate permit system for ski areas. The permits were granted for 40 years, not just one, so the banks were happy about that. And then, even though the act didn't specify it, the Forest Service adopted a series of administrative rules that required annual development plans, operating plans, engineering plans, site-specific analyses for individual resorts, and required the resorts to follow NEPA guidelines. That's the National Environmental Policy Act. This whole act was designed to formalize the ski resort permit process on national forests to make it more organized and efficient for this particular use of public land, skiing and snowboarding in resorts. Something interesting happened after NF SAPA was passed though. Take a look at these numbers. They're for total ski resorts, not just ones on public land, but they'll give you an idea of the trend regardless. From 1930 to 1980, pre-NF SAPA, 286 new ski resorts were built in the United States. Since then, fewer than 50 have been constructed. There's a couple reasons for this, and this is where ski resorts and public lands issues start to overlap. Like, this is where we start to talk about what we want public lands to be and how we think they should be used. Ski resorts, like other uses of public land, are not immune to scrutiny and discussion. Just like we do with logging and grazing and mining and hiking and mountain biking and just about everything else, there's a discussion to be had about how ski resorts use public land. A big point of emphasis in that discussion is environmental impact. It's not exactly a secret that ski resorts have negative environmental impacts. I mean, you're carving ski runs into a mountainside. That means habitat fragmentation and carbon emissions. There are concerns over excessive water use, air and water quality, and the sprawling development patterns that resort towns tend to encourage. The ever-pervasive issue of climate change also raises questions over the long-term viability of ski resorts. In this way, environmental opposition is one of the reasons resort development is down, along with more environmentally sensitive regulations from the Forest Service. On the other hand though, ski proponents counter that these effects are concentrated. Remember, ski resorts only use 0.1% of national forest land. They also argue that the economic and recreational benefits of skiing outweigh those negative environmental impacts. Skiing in general is a multi-billion dollar industry, and according to a Forest Service estimate, skiing on national forests generated $2.5 billion for the national economy fully 25% of the Forest Service's overall output. Skiing generates more revenue for the Forest Service than timber sales and every single other recreational use combined. These economic benefits are not insignificant for these small rural areas in the mountains, places which would otherwise basically struggle to survive. A large portion of their economies are based on recreation, including skiing. Now, currently there is a problem with this revenue staying in the forests themselves. Currently, the use fees resorts pay to the federal government go into the US general treasury. They do not stay in the national forests that generated those fees. Lots of people would like to see this changed, and there's actually a bill in Congress right now to rectify this issue, aptly named the SHRED Act. Link down below if you want to learn more. But like, the public benefits from this arrangement too, right? That was actually one of the main justifications Congress had for passing in F SAPA. They saw how big skiing was becoming, and they thought it was a great way for people to be healthy and appreciate the outdoors and spiritually enrich themselves. In short, they saw it as a perfectly reasonable use of public lands. Like, this is what public land should be used for, is basically what they were saying. Ski resorts would profit off of public lands, yes, but 
local economies would benefit, and so would the general public. Now, there's also the question of access. Is it fair for private resorts to restrict public access to public land? Well, maybe they can't. Policies vary by resort, but there are plenty of places where if you wanted to, you could just walk up the mountain and ski back down. But at these resorts, you're not really paying for accessing the land. You're paying for ski lifts and ski patrols and the snow machines and the groom slopes, things that cost ski resorts lots of money to maintain. And so, as with like every other public lands issue, your stance on ski resorts probably has a lot to do with how you think public lands should be used. In an era of climate change and environmental destruction, are ski resorts a good use of public land? Or do the economic benefits and recreational opportunities outweigh those concerns? We do factor those into other public lands decisions after all. The way I see it, as I do with like every other public lands issue, there's room for a middle ground here. The environmental concerns are critically important, no doubt, especially in this day and age. We need to do everything we can to minimize the environmental impact from ski resorts. And in fact, that is being done. But I also see the need for rural economic development. In many cases, ski resorts are located on public lands formerly used for mining or other extractive uses, uses which are unsustainable and don't offer long-term economic benefits. If the SHRED Act passes, we can reinvest the money these forests generate right back into their conservation, ensuring long-term environmental and economic benefits. And of course, recreation plays a big role in this too. I mean, 16% of national forest visitation is skiing, remember. That's not insignificant. And having a place where the public can come to enjoy one of the most popular winter sports in the world is, I think, a valid use of public lands. So what do you think? Is your favorite ski resort on public lands? Do you think it should be? Let me know in the comments down below. Like and subscribe for more park stories, follow me on Instagram, check out my Patreon. I just revamped it for this year actually. I'm now doing behind the scenes videos, which I'm super excited about. I think people are going to find these really helpful for how I like make these videos. So you can find those. I have a book club, I have a Discord, I do AMAs. There's a bunch of good stuff over there if you want to check it out. Link down below. Alright, I'm out of here. I'll see you all next time. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.